This episode is brought to you by Audible. President Biden announcing his long-awaited plan to forgive student loans. Billions of dollars in student loans. Student loan forgiveness. Student loan forgiveness. And student loan debt forgiveness. Biden recently announced his student loan forgiveness plan. And it sucks. Assuming that its projected cost of $300 billion is how much debt will be forgiven, all this plan will do is take us from here to here. Biden's plan includes no significant reforms to education tuition or loans, and the government has told us those reforms aren't coming. So it's fair to assume that the only thing Biden's done is buy us about four or five years and then we'll soon be right back here, with $1.7 trillion of student loan debt. Millions of Americans will get some relief, and that's good, but millions more will just take their place very soon, and that's bad. How did we ever get to this point, with a Canadian GDP-sized hole in students' pockets? As usual, we can thank Ronald Reagan. Our story begins in the late 60s and early 70s, when colleges suddenly started charging tuition. The late 60s and early 70s were in many ways a groovy time, but in many other, probably more important ways, they were a very not groovy time. The 60s had the Beatles, the Beach Boys, and the relentless unaliving of Vietnamese and other quote-unquote Indo-Chinese citizens in a nearly two decades long conflict involving millions of tons of bombs dropped on civilians and a brutal campaign of chemical warfare, the devastating consequences of which continue to affect multiple countries to this day. What a time. I promise this video is still about student loans. Stay with me. Few things affected the 60s and 70s like the Vietnam War did. Over the course of these decades, Americans were progressively exposed to more and more of the suffering inflicted by their own country abroad, as images of the conflict and leaked military documents began circulating in the American press. The Vietnam War showcased untold violence, served no purpose to the average American, and only really benefited the US's bloated war industry. So eventually, Americans began protesting this brutal and useless war, mobilizing all across the country and, most importantly, on college campuses. This is where the problems began. While the thought of ending an already decade-long, expensive, cruel, and soon-to-be lost war might make most people happy, it made one California governor very not happy. Cue Ronald Reagan. At this time, two things were true. California's UC schools charged no tuition for in-state residents, and Ronald Reagan had just won his second term in office. As a conservative and a fierce supporter of the Vietnam War, all these protests happening on California college campuses were deeply upsetting to Ronald. They challenged the ruling government in a very public way. So, in response, Reagan shut down all 28 UC and Cal State campuses. That might seem excessive, and it was, but what you need to understand is that these protests weren't just upsetting or a simple act of vocal political opposition. These protests were deeply worrying to Reagan and the rest of his friends because of what they signaled for the future. In the words of one of Reagan's top advisors, these protests signaled the coming of a dangerous, quote, educated proletariat, saying, quote, we have to be selective on who we allow to go through higher education. Meaning, of course, we need to stop letting all these poor people in. They're starting to get the idea that they can change society. That's because up to that point, many American colleges had either been free to access, with zero tuition fees for in-state residents, or cost very little. Adjusted for inflation, education before the late 60s and 70s maxed out in the ballpark of a couple thousand dollars at an elite private school like Dartmouth. Most Americans who went to college did so for very little money. Just for reference, the Education Data Initiative estimates that today, the ultimate price of a bachelor's degree may be as high as half a million dollars, or as low as a hundred thousand in the best case scenario, for a public four-year degree at an in-state institution. But just because it was a lot cheaper didn't mean college was necessarily always accessible. Historically, colleges were filled almost exclusively by white upper-class young men. And that's because, for most poor people, the opportunity cost of college was too high. Spending time not earning money when basic needs were harder to meet didn't make sense for most Americans, especially when a high school education was enough for a middle-class status. But that's far from the whole picture. Colleges were filled with upper-class white young men because women, black people, and non-Christians, meaning Jewish people specifically, were either flat-out prohibited from attending college, segregated into separate institutions, or subjected to maximum enrollment quotas. 
All in all, college was cheap at least in part because it didn't need to be expensive to keep the lower classes and other marginalized groups out. But eventually, that would change. Starting in the 20th century, college began affording upward mobility for more and more members of the working class, and its opportunity cost lowered. Exclusionary politics were very slowly dropped, and government programs like the GI Bill allowed World War II veterans to attend college at no cost. College became more accessible in the 20th century, so enrollment grew, particularly in the lower classes who had been kept out for so long. And that became a problem for the ruling class. As Reagan's advisor told the press, educating the proletariat had the undesirable effect of producing revolutionary stirrings. A college education gave thousands of people unprecedented time, and to some extent tools, to criticize the inequality and violence that characterized their lives and the whole of the US. Far from being indoctrination centers, colleges had the merit of at the very least exposing students to non-capitalist ideas, though often in less than positive terms, to put it mildly. To some, that was enough. Colleges also had the benefit of being a place for communities to form and to gather, and the convergence of all these different factors meant that college campuses suddenly became a new place where militant opposition to the government and the greater economic system could form a fact that was very concerning to the people who benefited from the inequality and violence of American society going unquestioned and unchallenged. This is why the 60s are remembered as a time of student protest. And the Vietnam protests were particularly concerning because, over time, they began to resonate with a lot of the American public. What if they grew? What if they became about something more fundamental than a single war? What if they started a revolution? Now, that might seem like a big leap, but Reagan and his buddies had reason to be worried. Student revolutions were not unheard of. And just two years before Reagan had shut down the UC and Cal State campuses, France had witnessed the events of May 68. For almost two months, France saw student protests in Paris turn into a semi-coherent, countrywide revolutionary movement, with a general strike that completely shut down the country's economy. During this proto-revolution, protesters attempted to bring an end to General de Gaulle's government, secure higher wages, run their own factories, and who knows, maybe even introduce socialism to the Western country at a large scale. And although this movement ultimately coordinated millions of people, what had been so concerning to anti-socialist observers was that it started with the protests of only a couple hundred students. While May 68 never became a full revolution, and failed in many important ways to achieve its goals, it nourished the idea that socialism could still get popular support even in prosperous, western, capitalist countries, and made college campuses a new place for these movements to emerge. So, Reagan quickly shut down the Vietnam protests, and from then on made every effort to cut the working class out of higher education. To do that, he, alongside then-President Richard Nixon, progressively transitioned colleges away from the state and federal funding model that had made them decently accessible up to that point. The public was told that this was part of the small government cost-cutting effort, and that the state needed to make immediate budget cuts, despite Nixon simultaneously kickstarting the ludicrously expensive war on drugs, which to date has cost the country a conservative $1 trillion through increased incarceration, policing, and police militarization. In a 1967 speech, Reagan said it plainly, There is the problem we just simply have a shortage of dollars. It is hard to believe there is no leeway for cost-cutting in the university program. With enough public support, states and the federal government started cutting off higher education. As a result, colleges across the country would increasingly need to rely on tuition for their finances. A tuition that would quickly snowball thanks to the kinds of predatory loans we've all grown accustomed to. Reagan and Nixon got their desired result. By making college expensive to attend, those who have an easier time accessing loans, or who flat out don't need loans to afford it, go to college at a much higher rate. In 2013, for example, college enrollment for kids from low-income families was under half of that of high-income enrollment. The result is that the transition to an expensive, tuition-based college model has cut off the working class from one of its places of emancipation and collective organizing. Not the only one, but an important one nonetheless. If you think that woke culture is what's suppressing free speech on college campuses, Consider how much more it hurts free speech to keep millions of working-class Americans out of the conversation entirely. The shift to a tuition-based model purposefully and successfully handicapped collective power. And expensive college education has also prevented more members of the working class from achieving individual power. 
After all, 95% of the House and 100% of the Senate has a bachelor's degree or more, many from the most expensive and elite colleges. In other words, the odds of getting to a place where members of the working class might be able to represent their own interests and translate them into action are actively stacked against them from the start. But there's a problem. The government can't just tell the poor they can't go to college outright or make it so obviously difficult. There needs to be some sort of justification. Otherwise, in political communication terms, telling the poor to get lost is what is commonly referred to as a stupid f***ing move. Thus, a series of narratives have emerged to try to justify this ideological commitment to exclusion. The first was the idea that the government absolutely needed to cost cut, as we've seen. For that, the demonization of college students as violent, reckless, or borderline idiotic hippies made college an easy target. But it doesn't stop there. When this shift inevitably made colleges more expensive to attend, loans, despite being incredibly predatory as we now know, were pitched as a form of inclusivity. In that same speech I quoted earlier, Reagan said as much, telling concerned working-class Americans that this suggestion to charge tuition resulted in the almost hysterical charge that this would deny educational opportunities to those of the most moderate means. This is obviously untrue. We made it plain that tuition must be accompanied by adequate loans. Obviously, Reagan made no mention of how punishing these loans would be once students had graduated. But he could rely on the popular imagination of a college education leading to a stable, middle-class American dream lifestyle not to address that. Then Reagan went on to cite a second reason why members of the working class shouldn't be worried they were suddenly getting cut off from higher ed. Quote, more important is the false impression given that enrollment in the university is now in some way based on the ability to pay. This is not true. Eligibility for the university actually is limited to those in the top 12% scholastically. On this principle, 88% of the high school students cannot go to the university regardless of their finances or their desires. In light of the emerging discourse that college was becoming a right, accessible to all, Conservatives reacted by digging in their heels and made sure higher education would continue to be seen only as a privilege. Because when higher education is a privilege, only those who are deemed deserving can get it. This was great because it appealed to the idea that hard work and natural talent alone would push our society's best into a place where they could grow their skills. But what wasn't said was that deservingness would obviously be assessed with metrics that favor the wealthy, like SATs. Then, this idea that a college education had to be deserved would also be used to support another exclusionary narrative. That if colleges were filled with people coming from the lower 88% of high school students, it would somehow make higher education worse. As Nixon put it, letting in quote-unquote less deserving people would lead our colleges to collapse their educational standards, in the misguided belief that this would promote opportunity. Conservatives successfully presented inclusion as a trade-off between opportunity and quality, as if you can't have both. They appealed to the value of excellence to justify the social reproduction of the elite, accessible only to the luckiest or most deserving of the lower classes. Today, a lot of this discourse is still floating around, with a couple new justifications. The cost-cutting speech obviously never left. When Bernie proposes his free or affordable college plan, for example, the first question is always, how much will this cost? And never, how come the wealthiest country on Earth can't seem to figure out something almost every other comparable nation has been able to do for decades? Or what about all that extra money going to the Pentagon to fund foreign wars? Then there are the new additions. For example, the idea that making college free would hurt the country's ability to twist low-income kids' arms and make them go to war as one Republican congressman flat out admitted. Loan debt is super important in this regard because now that Dodge has announced they're discontinuing the Charger and Challenger, if student loan debt also goes away, the US military will never get a new recruit ever again. <laughs> Jokes aside, we've also seen the idea emerge that students are wasting their time going to college and learning skills they won't need on the job. As if, one, the purpose of a college education was job training, not education as the name implies, and two, as if this was the student's fault and not business's inability, or rather utter incompetence, to take the most well-trained and well-educated generation in perhaps all of human history and do something with it. In a similar vein, we've seen the emergence of the just-go-to-vocational-school discourse become a favorite trope in recent years. You've probably heard this as the learn-how-to-weld argument, coming out of Marco Rubio's mouth, for example. 
and make higher education faster and easier to access, especially vocational training. For the life of me, I don't know why we have stigmatized vocational education. Welders make more money than philosophers. We need more welders and less philosophers. And just to quickly debunk this, one, welders don't make more than philosophy majors, or more than other college grads in general. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the average salary for an experienced welder is 36 k a year, while college graduates in general make around 50 to 60 k right out of college, and people who stick to a bachelor's in philosophy make on average about 51 k mid-career. Only the top 10% of welders make 63 k and above. It's not an especially lucrative job, so there's that. 2. Vocational training is college. To learn how to weld, you need to take multiple classes over multiple years after high school in a variety of different kinds of welding, from basic metal cutting classes to arc welding, stick welding, and gas metal arc welding. Not to mention classes in math, English, and metallurgy, as well as classes to learn the symbols and specifications used in blueprints, most of which happens at a college. The divide between vocational schools on the one hand and the supposedly completely different colleges on the other is nothing more than a rhetorical trick trying to make college education seem worthless in pop culture, which allows governments to slash higher ed budgets. The idea is that once you associate the phrase higher education only with quote unquote useless majors, you'll see no problem in thinning out their budgets. And just to be clear, welding is an awesome, useful job. But is it a morally superior educational path, or is it better paid than the average degree? No. At the end of the day, there's a million different reasons to make college free. It would cost less than the current model. Free millions of Americans from a modern form of debt peonage, the average sentence of which is 20 years long. And invite thousands of people into immediately necessary fields like medicine that are too expensive today. But more than all that, it would give more people the freedom to cultivate their interests at a higher level, gaining skills and knowledge in fields that they genuinely want to learn about. And that's worth something too. If you want to live in the freest country on earth, people need to be free to make the innocent decision to learn, without going bankrupt or being in debt their entire adult lives. It's that simple. After all, this problem is only two generations old. It wasn't always like this. And it doesn't have to be this way now. Student loans and debt in general is a pretty fraught topic in the US. Things that the rest of the world rightly sees as absurd, we simply accept as a normal part of life. In order to solve these problems, we first need to understand them. I try my best to learn and understand as much as I can so I can share with others. And one way I like to do that is by listening to audiobooks. I travel a lot for work, so I have plenty of time to sit on planes and listen to fascinating audiobooks on Audible. One that I enjoyed recently, and that really speaks to these challenges, is Debt the First 5,000 Years by the late David Graeber. It's an enlightening journey from the ancient past all the way up to the present and our modern system of debt. If you like to learn as much as I do, getting to pick a free audiobook every month is pretty nice. I don't think I can accurately convey how much I love Audible. I struggle to sit down and read a book. But with Audible, I can get through all the titles I've wanted to, all while running errands, or commuting, or traveling for work. It's completely changed how I learn. If you enjoyed this week's video, I highly recommend you check out Debt the First 5,000 Years on Audible. It's a fantastic listen. So if you'd like to help support my channel so I can produce more content like this, visit audible.com slash second thought or text second thought, one word, to 500, 500 Sign up today and get your first month absolutely free. It really does help support me and my channel. Get started by following the link below or by texting second thought to 500, 500. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous content by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.